Actually, I have given some topics for you to do the presentations, which is very important that uh, the presentation title is going to cover most of the, the subject areas, not all. Uh, so until you do this presentation, actually it's a little bit difficult for me to continue the lectures uh, because, uh, because you should uh, you should have given the opportunity first to talk on a particular topic and discuss then only we can uh, move into the the deeper into the subject right so what are we going to do today um, I'm going to talk about uh, on this aspect uh, particularly the the what are the factors affecting the the distribution of organisms within the marine environment. It's not only the distribution actually. So why marine animals find in different areas? Why we get different organisms in different areas? And there are a lot of uh, regions and different ecosystems. Right? So what factors govern in this uh, variation species in different areas? Uh, there are so many factors so complicated sometimes um, what i'm to what i'm trying to give you is just an overview of uh, the factors right so since you will be doing some presentation you might need to touch these aspects because of for example someone doing the deep water uh, fish they will have a lot of other factors affecting for them uh, and the the organisms living in the coastal zone, in the coral reefs, in the mangroves, like they have all have different uh, factors affecting them. And then we will revisit these things. So that's why I'm going to give a very brief overview on what are the factors actually governing the the existence and the distribution of organisms. Right. So that's what we're going to talk today. Right? Um, if we go back to the uh, last week's lecture, so you might remember that we divided the ocean into different uh, zones, uh, particularly the, the, the benthic environment has different zones and the pelagic environment, that's the water column, they have different zones. <clears throat> At the same time, you can divide the ocean in the, the horizontally as the nearitic and oceanic. I hope you will all remember these things. So, um, so in reality, actually these regions, as you remember, like this, these are, these regions may be based on the depth, like 100 to 200, up to 200 meters is one region. I say up to 1000, then another region. Up to 4,000, another region. Right? So though we are really considering here the the depth, actual the zonation of the or the water column, it's actually because of the the, the animal distribution. Actually, uh, that's why we call them as a sort of a bio zones. Right. So these zones are sort of um, categorized or subdivided based on the, the organisms, the distribution, right? They are looking at their ranges. Where do they, like this particular group of uh, species, where do they find, like considering these uh, animals uh, uh, found in different regions, that's why we call this as bioregion, right? So <clears throat> I hope could you got some uh, idea about this, uh, the narrative zone and the oceanic zone then we have the the epipelagic mesopelagic pelagic and mesopelagic that's the uh, the water column and then the benthic realm again you can divide as the uh, the here as the littoral sub littoral and like the the sub oceanic region or more likely we divide them as the bethyl zone, the bicel zone, or hadral zone. Earlier we like 
uh, learn this and as more depth or related uh, zones but uh, actually there are some these are very much linked to the the animal distribution as well right so <clears throat> Now, if you look at the marine environment, it's as we all know, it's going to be a very unique environment. There are a lot of factors, and and there are um, the animals also have to cope with this many marine environment, right? Uh, because the in usually the marine environment is sort of a more extreme environment than the terrestrial environment in many cases right uh, only the difference is because of the the water sea water little bit stable than land because the the for example temperature and a lot of factors you don't see a great variation in, um, instantly or right it take long time to change the temperature and, and factors so a <clears throat> little bit more stable than the terrestrial environment but the thing is uh, the then because of that so since the marine environment is more stable in the i mean in the locally it's stable regionally of course there are a lot of variation so the animals living in there also like they are adapted to the particular environmental condition right so so that's why it's fine they find very difficult to move into another regions because the the animals living in the marine environment also uh, <clears throat> they are less adaptable to variety i mean there can be a lot of uh, differences like but in general the the marine organisms are less adapted the, than the the terrestrial organism, the terrestrial environment, because of the surrounding environment is air. Many factors change quickly than the sea, right? So, so that difference is there. On the other hand, as I mentioned, the marine environment is a little bit more extreme. There are extreme conditions uh, sometimes than the terrestrial environment, right? So we'll look at these things. Uh, why marine environment can be extreme? Right? Uh, I have given some of the, the examples here. Um, this is just taking the like a deep water, for example, right? in the, any um, area in the ocean, you can have some extreme condition. But if you, for example, I have taken here the deep water. Right? So, so what are why we call this? the extreme here in the deep waters is that the most animal living in the deep waters they might not have to see any light during their whole life right because it's total darkness the, the ocean depths are under total darkness uh, below thousand meters in many cases but in some motions even less than that uh, so they have to do under complete darkness throughout their life so that's something unique and that's why we call it extreme sort of environment right and the other variation like the temperature right the temperature can be very very low as you go down the this the ocean bottoms you have less and less temperature right the temperature can be as low as uh, two three degrees centigrade it's just like a freezing right and then another thing is like a very high oxygen concentration right? i'll come to this thing later on uh, some might think that the high oxygen may be good for the organism but uh, we know that the too much oxygen also going to cause problem because we call oxygen toxicity right? so the everything has to be in the right amount but not too low or too high then there will be um, um, extreme condition then and the high pressure right so extremely high pressure in the ocean depth making is one of the reason why the, the ocean depths are extreme environment right? 
and other than that there can be a lot of even the strong deep water currents in the in the ocean depths which cause a lot of disturbances to the marine environment but in general of course more stable in the ocean bottom but uh, uh, time to time there can be some strong deep water currents that also will make the the ocean depth that six right so these are few examples but uh, everywhere in the ocean you will have this kind of extreme conditions uh, that might affect different organisms in different ways right so i hope you got some idea about this and uh, uh, let's talk uh, let's take some examples what are the limiting factors or what are the factors that govern the 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 existence as well as the distribution of marine organisms right so i have given here the uh, list of factors the limiting factors so that from the light to temperature salinity the nutrients the amount of nutrients in the water then the soil gases uh, then the the depth and the and geographical regions even may be different and will will uh, support animals in different ways right so these are some of the factors right? but uh, there are more than that and then there are the biological factors as well right so it's so complicated actually uh, but uh, but we generally we will take these as examples and then during the our like uh, the deep understanding or during our sessions on the uh, different ecosystems that you are going to present so we will have more uh, a specific type of factors that uh, affect different ecosystem for example if it's a coral reef there will be a, a whole set of different factors affecting the the existence of coral reefs and the the organisms in a coral reef so that's these are unique to coral reef and in mangrove ecosystem it's different but in what i have taken here is some general factors that would affect the 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 marine organism right so <clears throat> so these factors actually uh, change substantially over the uh, different areas in the ocean and that limit the 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 distribution and that uh, determine the distribution of marine organisms as well right so uh, from light to temperature pressure and and all these factors affecting the the organism and and as you can see in the the diagram on your right uh, and that's how you see the 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 different animals grouped in different areas and based on these factors right, depend on one or several factors the organism will um, grouped in different area right so any group of animals right uh, sometimes in the ecology we call them as sort of assemblage right it's a group of organisms in a particular area we call as assemblage right but actually the term assemblage has a little bit more uh, deeper meaning which we will talk about later but for the moment we call them as a group like right? this group living in here in the weasel zone and they will restrict it to this area they will never go into this area or this area right they won't be able to go there and the same time any animal any group of any group that live here they won't be able to go here or here and similarly so they are limited in their distribution uh based on these limiting factors right so it is very important that we have some understanding about this uh, the factors that govern the the distribution of organism right so we'll take very briefly each and every this uh, the factors we mentioned right so to be very brief as i mentioned because these factors there are a lot of information about these factors um, 
I think aquatic students have done a little bit on this and for their oceanography class. Um, so I don't want to go into very detail, but uh, uh, those who are just doing the zoology might not have uh, not gone through these things, of course. Uh, but these are not something uh, the rocket science. Uh, you already heard this thing even for your environment science or many, many other courses as well, right? So if you take the 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 first uh, parameter as the light, right? So light going to be one of the key factor determine the 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 organisms distribution within the uh, marine environment, right? So the light penetration, the how much light is penetrate and how far the light can penetrate is a key determinant. Right? So the light uh, is actually needed for the photosynthesis. Right? So the photosynthesis and the amount of photosynthesis determine the everything else in the marine environment. So how much biomass we get and what kind of organisms are there, They're very much determined by this, uh, the photosynthesis and the availability of food. Right, so, uh, <clears throat> so what differences are there? Right, so usually there's more light penetration in the coastal zone. Right, the the clear, more clear the water it has more, which means it's more light, and there's more light go into the deeper into the ocean. Right, so as you can see in the this. Uh, uh, diagram right if it is clear water and the light go into the deep and just obvious something but um, it's less clear waters like this we call it more the the uh, turbulent product turbidity is high or more sedimentation if there is more sediment which means there's less light going into the deep right so uh, <clears throat> i don't know any one of you here has go deep into the ocean, at least one of you, if you have diving, right? Uh, even a uh, skin diving or scuba diving, right? Uh, one of the key thing affect your diving experience is light, right? How much light available in the, in the ocean deep. Right, and the, how clear it is, right? So it's very important. It's not only for the for the photosynthesis, but if you're a diver, so this is very important. Uh, and you don't have to go like 50 meters, 100 meters to be like, to get this kind of a turbid water. Right? Sometimes even the shallow coastal waters, maybe few meters, five meters, 10 meters time, you will get this kind of very turbid water, right? It's depend on the, the ocean condition, right? So even five meter, 10 meter, right? So uh, uh, as I mentioned, if you are a diver, you will have this experience. Sometimes you go down, right? You won't be able to see even like a few, like a, even less than meter, you can't see anything, right? Less than even like a half a meter, only you can see because of the extremely turbid water sometimes, especially after like during the rainy season, during after the monsoon, like uh, the like after extreme weather event, the, the ocean water can be extremely turbid, right? So uh, you won't be able to see anything, right? So so if really any of you going to be a marine ecologist, right? So we forget about everything, but uh, so like if you are want to be a ecologist, so for ecologists, this light penetration is very important and then you won't have any dive experience. And if, for example, you're doing a underwater survey for a, like in a coral reef, and you want to get an underwater photograph, you want to do some transects underwater. And if you can't see anything, and there's no any use of doing any underwater, right? So one of the key thing, the how the, 
the clarity of the vote is very important right so so i had i have had lot of experience with this this right so uh, if you are diving if you are doing ecological studies so you have to keep uh, uh, in touch with the like a divers in the particular area especially the dive centers and then uh, then if they have gone to the sea and they will say whether the, the these days what is the condition of the ocean if it is not clear enough there is no use of doing any ecological study and so that's why uh, to become a marine ecologist it's very much very uh, the temperature uh, the sorry the the weather dependent right you can't do any kind of ecological marine ecological study if the visibility is uh, bad right so uh, it's not for the marine organism but for a marine ecologist so the light going to be a very important factor and uh, within a year you will have a very short period of time in the marine environment where you will have the clear waters right so uh, so if you are thinking of becoming a marine ecologist so we have to have that uh, in mind always right so becoming a marine ecologist not easy as well as you don't have much time to do your ecological study uh, underwater surveys <clears throat> so within that short period of time you have to do everything uh, since it's very much weather dependent right so i have a lot of experience like you won't be able to take even a single photograph right and because the visibility is so bad and if you can't if you can't see anything you can't do anything right so then you have to use other form of a getting information from the marine number so it's so you can imagine the the life of a marine ecologist so very much depend on the light right so and it did make a presentation at that topic karan gayi so campus right so uh, so that's the about the the light right so the the other thing is the the why uh, the amount of light penetrate in the different areas i, I think i have mentioned this before uh, the different uh, the the light or the different wavelength of the 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 the, the spectrum uh, absorbed differently in the marine environment as you would see from this uh, the right uh, diagram and then here too right the the red color absorbed in the top layers and the orange color go a little bit more yellow more and green a little bit more and the blue is the the color that goes or the the, the the least absorbed and the, it goes the most deep waters and and if you remember right so this is the reason why the ocean is usually in blue color right so they, because the blue colors scatter in the the ocean uh, more than the other colors right so uh, so that's the the, the, the different uh, difference in the light penetration right so again for a marine ecologist this is also very important right Uh, it's not for the marine organisms usually but for marine ecologists this information is very important because you see if if you are a marine ecologist you want to take a photograph somewhere here any uh, fish here right so in this area you won't get any yellow colors green color blue color right sorry you won't get the red color or orange color Right. If it is here, not even the yellow. Right. These colors are not going through the the sea water, and any fish living here, they won't show any of these colors. Right, only these colors. Right. So, think of a 
that also right uh, no matter what kind of a the highest quality camera you get uh, you won't get the the exact color that fish has because that colors are not available in that area right so that's why you have to use some artificial illumination artificial light to illuminate fish to get the color again or otherwise you have to use the color filters uh, to get the photographs and get the right colors from the that particular area right so there are a lot of uh, uh, difficulties for a marine ecologists to the work on these kind of a, uh, environment right all right <clears throat> so the main factor that determine the light penetration is the turbidity that is how much uh, the sediment uh, in the marine environment as well as it's not only the sediment but also how much the phytoplankton and the zooplankton is available in the marine environment right so uh, that also determine the light penetration right so the water transparency depend on the the particles it can be even the the availability of plankton or right so there's too many uh, plankton if too many plankton means um, that also causes a lot of turbidity um, right <clears throat> um, right so so that's the the the, the light availability uh, in the marine environment. Uh, so how does it affect? So as I mentioned, the 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 water transparency in the the marine water is very much influenced by the the amount of uh, sediments. Right. So um, in the marine environment, there's a lot of flows in the the marine sediment from the coastal zone towards the deep waters as we call the uh, sediment flume right it's like a huge rivers that bring a, a sediment like this right in the previous slide you could have seen this uh, the rivers carrying the sediment flow and similarly in the ocean also uh, there are a lot of channels that bring or take these sediments into the deep ocean uh, bottoms, right? So, which making the 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 marine environments also extremely turbid, right? And <clears throat> uh, especially in the in the ocean, like uh, in the country like us in the tropics, where we have the monsoonal changes. Right, so with the monsoon, there are a lot of changes in the ocean, in oceanographic conditions, especially the ocean currents, and make the ocean extremely turbid. Right, so mm -hmm. that affect the the one way for the light penetration. On the other hand, that badly affect the the photosynthesis, and that again affect the availability of food. Uh, as well right so the water transparency is one of the key factors that affect the marine organism particularly the productivity of the ocean but at the same time this is also badly affect the any ecology to like ecological studies as well right so um, right so that's about the 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 water transparency, All right? Uh, anyone have any questions? Right? I really want you to engage in the the discussion. All right? Anyone have question so far? Hmm? No one. Right, so no questions, okay. So still the uh, chat window is open. If you have a question, you can uh, uh, send a chat message as well, right? Right, from the, the light to the next important uh, parameter in the marine environment is the temperature, right? So 
of course, there is a, the, the light is very important for the marine environment, but temperature going to be even important for the marine environment, not only for the marine any environment, of course, the temperature going to be one of the key determinant of the most of the other parameters in the, in the environment as well, right? Uh, uh, because the the temperature affect almost everything in the environment, right? And including the the animals, because the, you know the organisms, they all uh, the organisms have to do internal internal metabolic activities. They all uh, temperature dependent. So uh, everybody, every organisms in the marine environment, so those, they are affected by the the temperature. So I don't want to go into detail, as you can see. Um, in the graph to the, I mean, this world map shows the, the temperature variations uh, along with the latitude, right? Uh, from the, the equator towards the polar region. You can see how the, the average temperature varies from uh, some uh, 28, 25 to 28 centigrade here. From there to 2015 and went up to, when you go to the polar region, it's going up to minus 20, right? Almost like plus 20, 20, 20 plus two, minus 20, like huge variation in temperature from the tropics to the, the temperate, right? So you can see the, like sort of a layers, right? Temperature layers here uh, across the globe. Right? So uh, that determine the many, the distribution of many organisms, especially the marine fish, right? So uh, even, to, even they migrate within these oceans, usually they have to follow these temperature layers, right? It's, it's hardly you see the, any any fish here living in the tropics that will move into the in a horizontal direction, so the vertical direction because there is a huge uh, variation in the temperature. They won't be able to withstand uh, the different temperatures, right? But uh, they have to move uh, more horizontally just to keep up with the, the temperature ranges, right? So it's a bit complicated, but uh, um, that's how the, the ocean temperature is uh, distributed in the marine environment, right? So um, if you look at the, the, the temperature variation, uh, uh, right? Uh, in the marine environment, right? Uh, I think I mentioned even the last week also, there are some uh, uh, thermal stratification in the marine environment, right? I hope you remember we discussed this earlier as well, what we call the, the thermal stratification, right? Uh, uh, as you can see here in this graph, there is a, a surface layer like this in this the top layer of the ocean right we what we call as a mixed layer with the because of the the waves and the surface currents this well mixed area here and uh, you get usually a sort of a, a regular temperature right and and in the deeper waters there is no mixing and there's a and also the there's no much high temperatures the temperature is going to be very low with the depth and between these the the higher temperature and the low temperature there's the sharp decline in temperature and that area we call thermocline um, i think you um, you heard about this term thermocline tapa uh, anathi so this is one of the the unique character in the marine environment the the ocean making the ocean 
uh, thermal stratification and the the important thing here is that the the organisms also stratified because of this uh, the temperature stratification right so organisms living in the this area in the deeper layers and they adapted to the the lower temperatures and they will never be able to come up to the surface where they have very high temperatures right and similarly the the higher temperatures in this well mixed layer any organism any group of organisms living here they will never get chance to go into the deep layers they are adapted to higher temperatures right so in between this this layer and this layer there is thermocline uh, which only only few species can tolerate or, or this uh, extreme temperature change right so what is important here is that uh, the thermocline act as a barrier for vertical migration right so this is very important for marine ecologists as well as for the marine organisms that this thermocline act as a vertical barrier right so and it's only very few species who could withstand or tolerate this huge temperature variation from the deeper waters to surface waters right so um, that make a, something very unique in the marine environment uh, this concept of thermocline we are limiting the distribution of marine organisms right so i hope you got that idea so again if you have a question uh, you can raise right um, <clears throat> so i have a little bit more information here about the thermocline right um, from this uh, well mixed to the less mixed or more stagnant waters here right um, in the oceanography we call this as a three box three box model right like in the ocean uh, they behave like a three boxes right the bottom box the top box and the in between there's another box and it's there's no chance for these boxes to mix right it's very less chances that the, they have to get mixed right now the important thing here for you to remember is that this all these concept called the thermocline and the these three box model everything actually you will get only in tropical and perhaps a little bit in the subtropical waters right but there is no such thermal stratification in the temperate region right when you go towards the pole region right there is no such thermal stratification of course there can be some thermal stratification temporarily in the uh, temperate region but not like in the tropical waters like in ours it's year round throughout the year you get this kind of a thermal stratification from surface to the bottom and this kind of a, a thermal stratification but as you would see from the this bottom uh, graphs right here um, during the winter the spring summer and the fall right there is huge variations in the the like uh, the temperature distribution like right? only in the summer there can be a little bit of uh, stratification as we can see in the tropical waters a little bit in the spring but in the winter and in the fall in the temperature there is no any stratification right especially in the winter you see during the winter the ocean get well mixed and there is no any thermal stratification and it's, it's well mixed right so <clears throat> so these factors very important like uh, so it's where you are in in the tropical waters you have totally different marine environment whereas in the 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 temperate region if you are ecologists in a temperate region and you will have a different totally different concepts uh, affecting the marine organisms right? so 
I hope you got the this idea. Uh, so this stratification, thermal stratification, you see in the the tropical countries, but uh, in the temperate countries only during the some seasons you have that thermal stratification. But uh, if you take this in the year round, there is a well mixing in the ocean water, right? So how does this affect the marine organisms? That's the important thing. So the this directly impact on the marine organisms, their distribution, like the primary productivity and everything is affected from this, uh, the concept of thermocline, right? So I'll come to this one a little bit later on. Um, <clears throat> and how does this uh, temperature affect the marine life? That is very important uh, to know a little bit on that. Uh, how does it going to affect the marine life, right? And uh, the marine organisms, we can divide, like basically we can divide into two groups as stenothermal and erythermal. And that based on how much they can stand or withstand the, the, the variation in temperatures, right? So some animals, they can tolerate the the large variation in temperature in the marine environment and we call them as eurythermal organisms right uh, they have more adapted to a large variations in the temperature so the eurythermal organisms so the group of animals and the others are stenothermals so they can tolerate only a small variation in the temperature right so uh, so this usually the stenothermal ones or the with little ability to tolerate the temperatures they are usually in the open ocean where you have relatively um, constant uh, temperatures and the other, on the other hand the erythermal or the uh, group of organisms you should found in the the coastal waters where they can tolerate uh, huge temperature differentials, right? So they can come even to the coast, close to the coast, like, and the temperature can be very high and move to a deeper waters where the temperature can be low, right? So the, they can move around in between these two layers, right? Uh, in the diagram here, you can see the, the, the in the close to the, the coast or the land, what is the temperature differences? from uh, right, uh, like from maximum to the minimum, right? I mean, this is theoretical in Sri Lanka, you won't get this huge variation. Uh, in general, if you take the land, so maximum can go up to 58 and the minimum up to minus 88. Uh, but in the coastal region, you see the, the variation is less than that. And the, even you go into the open ocean, this variation is very low, right? You can see uh, a huge variation in the land and towards the ocean, you have less and less variation in the, the temperature side. So these concepts are very important for uh, marine organisms, right? So they are very much affected by this concept, right? So, and now you can link this, uh, the concept with your biological understanding uh, I think we have done ecology, you have done learned ecology and um, animal physiology and a lot, a, lot, a lot of these adaptations the animals have to the, the temperatures, right? Uh, you see the, any animals living in the cold environment and warm environment, they have unique features, right? Uh, for example, in the cool, cold waters, uh, the the fish has different uh, features, right? Uh, uh, smaller in cooler water. It's not really, I think this is supposed to be other way around. Usually the, especially the fish and uh, most of the fish in the, they are in the colder water, they are usually a larger, they can grow into larger sizes. They can grow very, right? In the tropical ocean, they grow fast and live short period of time, but on the, on the on the opposite in the in the colder waters, right? They can they grow very slow, 
right? And they have longer lifespans, and usually they are bigger, right? I have correct the top one. It should be other way around. Uh, and these variations are there, right? So, <clears throat> uh, and the other hand, the there's more species in the warmer waters and less species in the uh, cold waters. And other important thing is more biomass in the cold waters and less biomass in the 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 warmer waters, right? So I don't know whether you got that right, right? More species in the warmer waters and more biomass in the colder waters. How can be? Can anyone explain this? Why there's more species in the warm waters and why less biomass? Anyone? Okay, pick a third one either. Species ready put in the warmer waters. Have I biomass ready put in the colder waters? Carter explained current pull on the maker. Long in only. Who's going to explain that? No one. All right. Um, I think I'll come to that one. So, so keep in mind that uh, there's more species in the warmer waters and more biomass in the uh, colder waters. Right? You can think of what are the 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 reasons behind the this concept, right? And now another thing that you have to look into the uh, as a marine ecologist is. Uh, the what kind of organisms that we get in the marine environment. Uh, like if you go into a little bit more into the, the ecology, um, like we know the concepts called the cold blooded versus warm blooded animals and the ectotherms versus endotherms, right? And uh, homeotherms versus poikilotherms, right? Confirmers versus regulators. Right? The warm blooded, warm blooded, and cold blooded animals, I know, ectotherms, I know, and endotherms, poikilotherms, and homeotherms. Confirmers versus regulators. Right now, now it's really time for you to this, put this concept into your study. How you can link that knowledge you, you got in your ecology now, how you can put this into the, uh, in the real world. Right. So what do you think, uh, what kind of animals should we get in the marine environment? I mean, it's not only the marine, but in the aquatic environment. So do we expect to have more homeotherms or poikilotherms? Or do we get more cold-blooded animals or warm-blooded animals, right? Who can explain? But if you on a marine environment, take a cold-blooded diet and the warm-blooded diet. Anyone? Go. Cool. Someone good to talk. Cold blooded. So you said there's more cold blooded animals than warm blooded. Why it's, why yes. why more cold blooded? Why the in the aquatic environment they should have more cold blooded animals than warm blooded? Water temperature varies from time to time. Mm -hmm. Mm. And, um, yes. Uh, so it's hard to regulate uh, body temperature always. Okay, Madhavi. It takes yeah. energy. Okay, good, uh, Madhavi. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, so you will have more cold-blooded animals. So most of the animals that you get in the marine environment, they might not only the marine, actually in the aquatic <clears throat> habitat, usually they are cold-blooded. Uh, Yes, the, the main reason that the, the because is they are living in the, the surrounding environment is water here. But we, as the terrestrial animal, we, our 
the we are living in the air right so our surrounding is air which is more thermal resistant right so the air is more thermal resistant but in other hand the water is more conductive or the temperature conductive and then animals living in the water they will lose their temperature their body heat or the warmth so quickly um, in the marine or the any aquatic environment so they will lose their temperature and if they want to keep the like if they wanted to be homeotherms right so they have to use lot of energy to maintain their body temperature because it's constantly losing and then it's energetically it's going to be a huge cost for the marine organisms to be uh, the homeotherm right so it's very important that aquatic animals should have adaptation something like a more to be more particular terms uh, so rather we call the more reg confirmers like they don't regulate their internal body temperatures but let them fluctuate with the the external temperature side so so they are more cold blooded especially the most of the fish they are cold blooded but uh, there are some exceptions uh, some like some have like a, some sort of ectothermal behavior something like even the blue swim crabs some flounders like in the deep water right so they have some adaptation like more ectothermal they can regulate a little bit of temperature but the problem for them is when there is low temperature the these organisms have to be almost dormant right so they won't be able to even move uh, when the temperature drops uh, because they can they can't withstand the low temperature right so these are some of the unique thing with the the marine organism uh um right uh, that's the answer competition is high in warm water because of more species of warm water so competition is species high um right that is a i think that is a someone has given an answer to the the why more species in the or more diverse in the uh in the tropical waters okay thanks for that answer so we'll come to this on the later on in the chat window we have that answer all right um <clears throat> let me play a small video here the distribution of temperature over earth is not uniform the temperature of the atmosphere of a place depends upon many factors let us learn about them one by one the first factor is the differential heating and cooling of land and water the land mass gets heated and cooled fast the water mass that is seas and oceans retain heat for a longer period equatorial waters remain hot and give rise to hot currents while the polar waters are cold the winds from the oceans and ocean currents transport heat or cold Warm currents move from equatorial to polar latitudes. They transport warm water to cooler regions. Currents which flow from higher polar latitudes to lower latitudes in the equatorial regions carry cool water to warm regions. In this way, Warm currents along the coast make the coastal areas warmer and cold currents make them cooler than usual. The warm North Atlantic drift raises the winter temperature of northwest Europe, especially that of the British Isles and Norway. 
Due to the influence of the warm North Atlantic drift, the port of Bergen, about 60 degrees north in Norway, remains open during the winter season, while the ports on the northeast coast of Canada, located in the same latitudes, remain frozen for several months because of the influence of the cold Labrador current. The temperature of a place also depends on the latitude. Temperature decreases with an increase in latitude on either side of the equator due to the spherical shape of the Earth and its annual revolution around the Sun. Sun's rays strike the Earth at varying angles of incidence owing to the spherical shape of the Earth and its inclination on its axis. Oblique or slanting rays not only travel a longer distance but also heat a larger area. Thus they have less heating power. The midday sun is almost overhead within the tropics but at oblique angles outside the tropics. The above two factors indicate that higher the latitude, colder is the place. On this basis, Earth is divided into five temperature zones. A. Torrid zone between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. B. North temperate zone. C. South temperate zone. And D. The two frigid zones. The sun's rays that fall over the torrid zone travel a shorter distance and heat up a smaller surface area, leading to a high temperature. Beyond the torrid zone, the sun's rays travel a longer distance because of the inclined axis and the revolution of the earth on its axis. Much of the heat is absorbed by clouds and water vapors or reflected back by the dust particles. The sun's rays fall in a slanting position and heat up a larger area. Beyond the torrid zone, the temperature goes on falling. The distance from the sea is another factor that influences the temperature of a place. The sun's rays pass through water to a great depth. Water is mobile and thus the warm water mixes easily with the cold water. Because of these reasons, the water is neither heated nor cooled quickly. However, the sun's rays heat a piece of land more rapidly because the heat obtained by the area does not mix with the other areas of land. Hence, the land gets heated or cooled quicker than water. Hence, during the day, the land is hotter than the sea. The hot air over the land becomes lighter and moves upwards. This creates a low-pressure area over the land. The air above the sea is cooler during this time. When the air blows towards the low-pressure area over the land, it lowers the temperature of the air on land. Such cool breeze that blows over the earth and cools the coastal regions is known as sea breeze. At night, the situation is reversed. The sea remains warmer than the land, so the breeze flows from land to sea. This land breeze makes the sea cooler. Thus, the interchange of breeze maintains the heat balance. The areas close to the sea have lower daily and annual ranges of temperature. Right, so... I hope you got the, some idea about the, the, the temperature, why it is different, right? So I wanted to play that video because uh, you not know, get uh, a better picture about the, 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 ocean, the temperature variation across the earth. 
and the one of the thing that you need to know that the ocean play a key role in this uh, the the temperature variations across the the globe mainly because of the ocean currents which take a lot of warmer and colder waters around the earth like the the currents take warmer tropic warmer waters from tropics to the 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 temperate region making temperate region a little bit more warmer on the other hand the cold water currents from the the temperate region that flow towards the the equator bring in cooler temperatures into the the warmer uh, warmer tropics making become uh, uh, tropics a little bit colder than it should be right so so these oceans play a key role in the the thermoregulation in the marine environment uh, uh, in the heat bite right i think uh, uh, just to get uh, understanding i think again uh, i have done this for the aquatic science students uh, but uh, you might have a professor or just students as well so for their benefit i put this videos um, so i think now we have some understanding on that right and uh, <clears throat> and as that video also explained uh, there are a lot of uh, changes in the the in the marine environment uh, in the mainly in the temperature as well as even the other parameters like here in the nutrients uh, along with this variation in the temperature you see the along with this temperature variation lot of other factors also affected and their distribution they are how much they are dissolved in the water and how it is how it change with the depth they all depend on the 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 very much on the temperature as well as so you can see here in the nutrient distribution uh, it's very much influenced by the temperature as well right so likewise uh, uh, other factors for example even the, the the distribution of phytoplankton sometimes <clears throat> no other even the organisms very much uh, depend on to some extent this uh, based on the temperature right and <clears throat> and as you can see from the the diagram in the, your right right how these can change uh, very much with the temperature variation this is like in the normal condition a normal situation <clears throat> uh, and if it is like el nino situation where you have usually a higher surface temperatures uh, like this uh, and uh, <clears throat> the the situation is very much different like this a united concentration in here and here is very different <clears throat> the distribution of diatom uh, is very different from here and here just because of the change in the temperature and how much it's affected <clears throat> the conditions in the marine environment as well as even the 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 organisms in this case is just the diatom right so the temperature is very much influence on the in the organism in the marine environment um, <clears throat> and next uh, slide also Uh, just to show you the 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 how much the temperature affect on the marine organisms like a, a different species uh, how do they follow and found in different areas in the ocean as also they follow the warm water currents uh, all these actually research findings about their the the migration and um, uh, in a different seasons you get different ocean currents and the different fish follow this uh, different conditions and we get different fish in different areas mainly because of they follow different temperatures right so uh, so again if you are marine ecologist not even the fishery scientist you, you need to know a little bit of this uh, the temperature variations and because the the fish follow this the thermal uh, gradients or the temperature differences in the marine right so it's very clear that the 
the temperature is one of the most influential factor in the marine environment uh, that affects everybody in the marine environment as well as the most of the other parameters in the marine environment as well right so from uh, temperature to the other important uh, parameter in the marine environment is just the salinity right uh, and in the marine environment uh, so salinity is the one of the key parameters as you know uh, usually in the marine uh, see marine waters we get a salinity somewhere uh, average like a 34 35 ppt right parts per thousand that's equivalent to 34 35 grams per thousand grams of sea water right so that's why we call it is ppt it's parts per thousand right so 35 parts per thousand parts of sea water right so the salinity is going to affect same as the temperature in different ways on the marine in organisms like a uh, the low salinity areas just like uh, the, the temperature the, it has found that the, there's a diversity also low if the salinity is low like for example if the, it is a, like a estuary where the salinity is low or the lagoon so you should you have less diverse right than the open ocean where the higher the salinity right um, and likewise the the temperate the salinity affecting the marine organisms in many different ways because the the based on the salt tolerance the how much the animals can tolerate tolerate the the salinity the based on that they we get different animals in different area right? so uh, <clears throat> if it is like a, a estuary the where the the salinity can be sometimes zero or sometimes can be 30 P ppt i mean there is a lot of uh, tidal incoming tides so any organism living in that there they have to be adapted from zero to 35 ppt it's, it's very difficult and open ocean on the other hand is very much a uh, constant salinities so they, they might not have problem right now the problem is the salinity is as you know when the any fish living in the the sea water now they have a problem because of the the diffusion and the osmosis and all the other the, the factors the water tend to go out of their body right because the the outside the 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 sea water the that's less water than the 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 body right so the usually in the fish body around 15 ppt like body also has some iron so salt and there you should be 15 ppt and the outside maybe 35 ppt which means less water outside so that means the water tend to go out of the 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 fish right um now what happened then if the water going out of their body right then they have to get more water into the, the their body the, how they can get the, i mean they have to get more fresh water into their body right but they are living in the sea water how they can get the fresh water in right so there is no other option they have to drink sea water right so they have to drink more sea water right now what happened so if they drink more sea water right because of the sea water right the, the because of uh, that that will lose more water because the the higher salinity right so that's why their gills are well adapted to secrete salt right so the the gills can excrete actually not secrete so they the salt can be excreted from there there are some glands in their gills a lot of uh, salt can be excreted to the outside as well as the 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 excretion like uh, they even their urine going to be uh, very concentrated they will have very less water right so they need to have this kind of a serious adaptation 
to live in the marine environment right so living in the marine environment is going to be really hard for the marine organism right so <clears throat> the same as the 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 previous uh, the temperature the organisms can be like different groups based based on the ability to uh, withstand the the temperature changes in the salinity the earlier we call this as the stenothermal and eurythermal and now it's the since it's dealing with the salinity we call the stenohaline and eurohaline every haline which means they stand they, these organisms can withstand the the huge fluctuation in the the salinity in the marine environment right so uh, especially the uh, species living in the coastal waters they tend to stand a huge variation so they are more uri haline even some fish like uh, uh, godea godea halatin one they they can tolerate, tolerate huge variation in salinity they can stay even in this fresh water but uh, they can in the very high temperatures in the sea as well so in the coastal zone in many areas you will see this godea fish in the estuary in particular in the river mouths because they can tolerate they can stand this uh, high temperatures right so uh, <clears throat> so i don't want to go into this uh, uh, more theoretical things like uh, small seas and then uh, uh diffusion which is which we already know so as i mentioned uh, previously the the marine fish they have to keep on drinking sea water and then the same thing they have to excrete uh sold from their gills uh and also they have to uh produce urine uh with more uh, less water or more concentrated um, um urine right so <clears throat> so these adaptations are there uh in the marine fish right so they drink large quantities of water right and secrete salt to their uh, salt gland in mainly in the uh, gills and then the highly concentrated small volume of uh, urine and, and the fresh water fish on the other hand they have the totally opposite side right uh, right so fish living in the fresh water have the opposite side of a fish living in the marine environment right so so they need to have a different adaptation on the other way around right so they they tend to get more water from outside into their body water inside right so they need to adapt to that condition uh, but in comparison uh, the actually the marine environment going to be harsher than the fresh water right so living in the marine environment is going to be really harsh uh, uh, for any organism right so so living in the sea is going to be difficult for anyone right so okay so we talk about this urihaline and stenohaline uh, and on the other hand so it is pretty sure that since the the marine environment uh, especially they are living in the water uh the uh, fish has to be more conformers in every actual it's maybe uh from the temperature also they have to be conformers on the other, on the other hand it's the salinity it can be also more conformers or also more regulators and that depend on the their adaptation their ability so some can be also more regulators some are also more conformers right so they have that adaptation for that right all right um mm, that's another small video just salt is everywhere on our planet but let me play this video some animals evolved to live in it while others didn't what happened there what caused this split What's up there, salty dogs? Trace here. Thanks for watching D News. Water is everywhere and is one of the main reasons life was able to evolve on Earth. It's 
pretty great. Salt is also everywhere. Salt and water together make up most of the water on our planet, and it's a major component of the beginning of life as we know it. Organisms need salt to survive. Salt draws water out of cells in a process called osmosis. Osmosis is the tendency of water to flow across a membrane to balance salinity. Essentially, nature wants to make sure there's a balanced level of salt everywhere. This is why if you drink salt water, you can die of dehydration. The water-salt balance gets out of whack, and the water gets pulled out of your cells. It's pretty serious. And yet, as bony fish moved from a salty sea into fresh water, also called sweet water, they had to eat salt to maintain that salt water balance. They still do this today, urinating any excess salt, sometimes up to a third of their body weight a day. We do this too, which is why we crave and love salt. But this brings us to the big question. If saltwater fish are drinking salt water constantly, how do they avoid dehydration due to osmosis? Well, there are two answers. One comes kind of built in. The gills of some saltwater species, like the flatfish turbot, have adapted to carry more of a special enzyme called gill sodium potassium ATPase. This allows their gills to leach salt from their bodies back into the ocean. Without this adaptation, they would die because of that high salinity. But some species of eel, salmon, bass, and flounder have adaptations that let them move between fresh and salt water. Species which can survive in a variety of salinities are referred to as urohaline. Some even actively adapt their gills or kidneys throughout their lives. There are a lot of species osmoregulating in a lot of different ways, you know, regulating osmosis. This is a great example of how evolution solves a problem along many different paths, something scientists call convergent evolution, which is so awesome. So let me give you a couple of examples. Anadromous fish are born in freshwater and live there for months before they make for salt water. In Atlantic salmon, an enzyme called type 2 deiodinase is produced in response to the longer daylight hours of spring. Puberty ain't just weird for humans. This enzyme alters the salmon's gills, initiating osmoregulation so they can safely swim into salty water. This is reversed when they return to rivers and streams to breed and start the process with their own little salmons. And a 2013 study in molecular and cellular proteomics detailed how a different adaptation evolved in tilapia. When placed into salted water gradually, the researchers found tilapia gills adapted, producing a specialized protein they called NDRG1. This let the tilapia survive in a saline environment as long as they had time to slowly adapt. A lot of fish evolution Evolution has happened in the last 400 million years. Fish have spread into pretty much every water-based environment on the planet. After the Great Dying 250 million years ago, which wiped out 95% of all marine species, evolution had to figure out how to osmoregulate again. Through an assortment of convergent evolutionary adaptations, freshwater fish repopulated the oceans, learning to deal with that super salty water. Eventually, they made it to land as well when a fish named Eustenopteron evolved into amphibians and tetrapods like you and me. Without salt and being able to regulate it, life as we know it wouldn't exist. Evolution's the best. Saltwater fish diversity is pretty incredible, thanks to evolution. And this year on Animal Planet's River Monsters, it's all about saltwater, baby. Don't miss new episodes of River Monsters every Thursday at 9, 8 central on Animal Planet. If you wonder why animals are the way they are, you belong with us here on D. All right. I think uh, that's a nice video actually, uh, where you can link your biology understanding, biology, evolution, and then ecology, everything into uh, into this uh, marine ecology, right? So where you can uh, have a better understanding. Uh, all right. Uh, <clears throat> now, if you uh, combine this, uh, like the the temperature and the salinity. Together, if you take um, maybe in, this, in the next slide, you will see this more uh, much better way. Like this is how the the temperature varies in the marine environment with depth. Right, so I'm talking about the tropical waters, right? And the and this is how the salinity change with the depth, it's opposite direction, right? And because of that, this temperature and the salinity and then the density change 
on the different way at which follow the same route as the the salinity right the density and the salinity has the same uh, pattern because the 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 salinity means the, the more salt right more salt means more denser right so the salinity and the the density are uh, right very related and the, with the temperature it is the opposite right so although we consider this temperature and salinity separately but uh, they act in the same time uh, so in the low latitude so you will have this uh, totally opposite uh, con uh, relationship with the temperature and the, the density because of the salinity variation as well as the temperature also depend on the uh, impact on the the density of water right and then you can like combine everything together as you can see in this diagram which i don't want to explain everything but uh, uh, you can read a little bit more on this aspect right so the next uh, parameter we're going to talk about the, uh, the the water pressure how the water pressure impact on the in the marine environment it's another uh, the temperature next the salinity now the water pressure so before the the light penetration like the water pressure also it's very important uh, phenomenon that affect the marine organisms uh, uh, very much all the the organisms are affected by the the pressure uh, because that pressure going to uh, affect very differently in, with the depth and they need to have a lot of adaptations like a uh, that's one of the reasons that the fish have lost their lungs and then no, not on the fish the marine organisms have lost their lungs right? so if they have the lungs so the lungs going to be very much affected by the the pressure uh, but if they do have lungs like something called whales they need to have other adaptation like their lungs they even their ribs they can they can sometimes collapse like if it is too, so hard they're going to crush the high pressure going to crush so they can some can even collapse a little bit right so and this is how and this diagram shows you uh, the like uh, you can get some insight on how the pressure can impact on the uh, uh, once uh, the internal cavities like for example lungs right and just to show that uh, like if you are a diver if you go down in the 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 ocean and the lungs will behave the same way as this balloon behave like so if the like their lungs are well expanded like this in the surface right every meter you go down and that lungs going to be right uh, a shrink like this like this and if you go even further the lungs going to be very small or they're going to be shrink substantial right so you won't be able to hold a lot of air in your uh, lungs as you go deeper right so so this is one of the main constraints that divers have to face right if you go very deep maybe 40 50 or 60 70 meters then an in the bottom you won't be able to stay like more than 10 15 minutes 15 20 minutes within as a maximum you can stay you have to come back uh, because you can't breathe well in that high pressure right so we are not adapted to live in the high pressure uh, and then you'll be in deep trouble right so because of this pressure right so the uh, the marine organisms have their own adaptations to withstand this pressure uh, right and then also they have other like uh, many adaptations to keep their buoyancy uh, we have in some uh, air pockets in some organisms but not many oh uh, something like a smaller organisms to the, their higher surface to volume ratios to to float and also the fish have something called the swim bladder rather than having a permanent structure like a lungs where they have to hold the 
AR yeah, all the time, but uh, they have something called this AR yeah, sex uh, called the swim bladder. When they want to float, they can like pump gas into the <clears throat> the their air yeah, sac, uh, and they can float. And when they want to go down, they will remove the air from the or pump out the air, and they can go down. Right, so <clears throat> they have this kind of a uh, unique adaptation. Uh, um, right. Uh, There's another small video just to show you the pressure, how pressure going to impact on the organisms. Sometimes when a fish is reeled up to the surface, it will appear inflated with its eyes bulging out of their sockets and its stomach projecting out of its mouth as if it's been blown up like a balloon. This type of bodily damage, caused by rapid changes in pressure, is called barotrauma. Under the sea, pressure increases by 14.7 pounds per square inch for every 33-foot increase in depth. So take the yellow-eye rockfish, which can live as deep as 1,800 feet, where there's over 800 pounds of pressure on every square inch. That's equivalent to the weight of a polar bear balancing on a quarter. Now. Boyle's gas law states that the volume of a gas is inversely related to pressure. So, any air-filled spaces like a rockfish's swim bladder or human lungs will compress as they descend deeper and expand as they ascend. After a fish bites a fisherman's hook and is quickly reeled up to the surface, the air in its swim bladder begins to expand. Its rapid expansion actually forces the fish's stomach out of its mouth while the increased internal pressure pushes its eyes out of their sockets, a condition called exophthalmia. Sometimes, rockfish eyes will even have a crystallized appearance from corneal emphysemas, little gas bubbles that build up inside the cornea. Thankfully, a scuba diver doesn't have a closed swim bladder to worry about. A diver can regulate pressure in her lungs by breathing out as she ascends, but must be wary of other laws of physics that are at play under the sea. Henry's law states that the amount of a gas that dissolves in a liquid is proportional to its partial pressure. The air a diver breathes is 78% nitrogen. At a higher pressure under the sea, the nitrogen from the air in a scuba tank diffuses into a diver's tissues in greater concentrations than it would on land. If the diver ascends too quickly, this built-up nitrogen can come out of solution and form microbubbles in her tissues, blood, and joints, causing decompression sickness, aka the bends. This is similar to the fizz of carbon dioxide coming out of your soda. Gas comes out of solution when the pressure is released, but for a diver, the bubbles cause severe pain and sometimes even death. Divers avoid falling victim to the bends by rising slowly and taking breaks along the way called decompression stops. So the gas has time to diffuse back out of their tissues and to be released through their breath. Just as a diver needs decompression, for a fish to recover, it needs recompression, which can be accomplished by putting it back in the sea. But that doesn't mean fish should just be tossed overboard. An inflated body will float and get scooped up by a hungry sea lion or pecked at by seagulls. There's a common myth that piercing its stomach with a needle will let air escape, allowing the fish to swim back down on its own. But that is one balloon that shouldn't be popped. To return a fish properly to its habitat, fishermen can use a descending device instead to lower it on a fishing line and release it at the right depth. As it heads home and recompression reduces gas volume, its eyes can return to their sockets and heal, and its stomach can move back into place. This fish will live to see another day, once more free to swim, eat, reproduce, and replenish the population. Right, so there are so much to learn in the marine ecology, right? And how we can use your understanding on the biology and the physics, the chemistry, how you can link this with the ecology. That's why the 
the most interesting thing with the ecologists because uh, you have to use all these concepts, put it in together uh, in the ecology, right? So, so becoming ecologists, that's why it's so something not easy, right? And uh, the other uh, differences are the, the the changes in the dissolved gas with depth. I think I did mention this uh, last week as well, like how the the oxygen con oxygen concentration change with depth and the carbon dioxide concentration change with the depth. Like right? so, these are affected by different factors. Um, uh, I think I asked this question before too. Why the oxygen is very high in the top, the surface because the the oxygen is more soluble in the uh, more uh, turbulent waters. Right? There's more turbulence means the more oxygen uh, dissolution, dissolution. And as you go deeper, the less turbulence means less oxygen dissolved in there. Now, again, the lower temperatures increase the, the oxygen partial pressure of the oxygen retention power of the water. That's why the oxygen increase again. But uh, the carbon dioxide behave differently because the, the solubility of carbon dioxide is uh, uh, determined by the pressure of the water. Right? As you know, the, that's why the soda bottle, so they can have more carbon dioxide if you can put it in the pressure. Uh, and as you go deeper, because of the high pressure, the, the carbon dioxide solubility increases. That's why you get more carbon dioxide as you go to the bottom, bottom right? Uh, so that's how the, the oxygen uh, and the carbon dioxide change with the, the, the depth. And then there is an area called the oxygen minimum layer or OML. Uh, which very much affect on the marine organism as well because anyone living here, they have very really less oxygen. And they have, again, in the deep waters, they have more uh, oxygen and the surface water more. And uh, nutrient also follow this pretty much a similar uh, uh, pattern with the depth, uh, but the opposite uh, with the the oxygen, right? So, because the nutrient solubility, uh, because nutrients uh, are more denser, right? Uh, they tend to sink into the bottom, and then they will have more nutrients in the bottom waters than in the surface waters, right? So that's why you uh, have this kind of a, 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 a graph, and the the nutrients, as you can see, the both uh, nitrate and uh, phosphate, this is how they change with the depth. Um, so all follow the similar routes, right? Um, all right, so these are the main factors that affect the marine uh, environment, uh, the distribution of organism as well as, but the other things like all these factors, temperature, light, uh, uh, perhaps salinity, not much, very much, but the light intensity and the nutrient and uh, all these affect the primary productivity of the ocean altogether. And the, the primary productivity uh, behave differently in the, with the ocean depth. Right? You, you can see the, the ocean productivity behave like this kind of uh, uh, behavior. Right, uh, there's less production in the very top layer because of the the high temperature, high wave radiation, which uh, tend light to enter to have in more little bit deeper waters. The surface waters are uh, not preferred by the phytoplankton, so we will have more productivity here. But as you go deeper, there's less light, less, and then that's where the productivity is going to be reduced over the depth, right? So, and the polar regions, the tropical regions have different uh, productivities. And this, actually this uh, graph is going to be a very important thing. You see the, the tropical waters, 
right the productivity remain pretty much same right so it's not it can't be like it shouldn't be this kind of a straight line but a, it's a small ups and down but it should be a pretty much same productivity throughout the year from yeah, right but uh, uh, the the polar regions will have very high productivities uh, in sometimes and in the in the, uh, the the subtropics they might have even a, a different peaks right you can see the like they have the peaks and these have very high productivity during the uh, uh, warmer month during the, the summer months and then you see the the tropics so the productivity is very very low in the ocean right but whereas in the the temperate countries they have productivity they are, have a pattern as well as their productivity is very high right? so that bring the reason why the i mentioned in the earlier the temperate countries they are less diverse but the bio biomass is very high right so the biomass is very high because the productivity is very high in the tropical sorry the temperate oceans right? they are more productive actually than the tropical waters but less diverse right that reflect that there should be more fish biomass in the temperate countries than tropical the oceans right so all right so that's about the the factors affecting the the marine environment i mean this is not a complete list uh, you will have uh, so many other factors affecting and we will discuss all these factors as we go along and uh, perhaps you as a group